right. Good morning. Good morning. I hope everybody is having a good morning. How many of you are ready for Christmas? Right? I mean, now let's be honest for a second. How many of you have completely finished all of your Christmas shopping? Would you please raise your hand? Oh, we've got a few. Okay, well, that's because Bernie doesn't buy anything for anybody. So I knew that part of this story. Now, somebody else raised their hand, though. Who else had their hand up? Was it an honest hand? Let me see. Oh, right down here, we have a few. Yes. So those of you who have not started Christmas shopping, you still have a few days left, but you're running out of time, okay? And if you don't go ahead and go, though, you're going to miss all the good gifts in case you were wondering about what to get me. So you want to go ahead and go over here pretty quick. And that, that way the good stuff won't be gone, right? So that's what Brian Moffat says, too. So we're, gonna, we're looking forward to Christmas. We have a great service plan for you today. Let's take a few minutes, though. And if you would, let's stand together and have a quick word of prayer. And then our praise team will come and lead us in a song or two of worship. And then we've got a, a lot of special music today and a lot of great things that are happening in our service. And I think you'll really enjoy it an awful lot. But let's go into the Lord's presence with prayer this morning, and then we'll go further in our service. Ready? Father, we thank you for this day and the blessings that you've given us. We thank you that we have this opportunity to gather at your house with your people. And Father, we pray today that you would come and work here as only you can. Lord, we need you more than we need any other 10,000 things, and we pray today, Father, that you would be in this service in all of its fullness, and Lord, in all of your power. Lord, thank you for the answered prayers that, Father, you've answered for our people. And Lord, for those who are uh, asking interest in our prayers today, I pray for those families as well. Lord, I thank you so much for those that are able to be here today in person, and Lord, for those who are participating online I pray, Father, you just bless and have your way. We rejoice, Father, in the greatness of your salvation, and we ask that you would just be with us today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say it, amen. amen. So let's remain standing for our first song, and then we'll go further in our service. Amen. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace, peace and goodwill toward men.
good morning. It is good to be in God's house today, amen? And this is the greatest time to be in God's house because it is Christmas time, the greatest time of the entire year. And it is our time where we get to do the lights, we get to do the presents, all the fun stuff, and we get to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And one of the great things we're going to do in the kids' ministry this month is we're focusing on generosity and how we can be generous to others during this Christmas season, but how God was most generous by giving us the greatest gift of all, his son, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be talking today in Children's Church about the actual Christmas story, about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and how it was probably one of the most unlikely and most humble births of all time being born basically in a barn with only a few smelly shepherds around to celebrate that very first Christmas morning. But we're going to be, so we're going to be talking about that today. And next Sunday, you're going to want to be here because our kids have been working on a very special Christmas song in Children's Church. Next Sunday here in the service, they're going to be doing that. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So you guys are definitely going to want to be here to see that and check that out. Also, we have a brand new uh, scripture verse for this month. It's going to come up here on the screen. This is the verse our kids are working on in Sunday school and in children's church for this month. And it says this, Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. 1 Timothy 6, 18. All right, so all my kids here today, we're going to shout this out as loud as we can on three. So I'm looking at a couple of you because I know you guys can really shout. Because you did it this morning in Sunday school, and I know you can do it the, right here in the service today. All right, this is your one time to be loud in the big sanctuary, so don't waste it. All right, so on three, we're going to shout this verse together. All the kids, ready? One, two, three. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. First Timothy six eighteen. All right, great job, guys. They're going to have that memorized and down pat where they won't need it on the screen by the end of the month. But we're going to go to the time of the service where we take up our offering. And as we do that, our kids will be dismissed in the back to Children's Church. But if you would like to, to give back a portion of what God has blessed you with, we have the plates down here in front. And we also have the online giving. So I'm just going to pray and just ask God's blessing in this offering. And then we'll continue with our service. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the greatest gift of all that is Jesus Christ. I thank you for this whole time of year, God. We just get, just get to have fun and to celebrate because, God, it is a great time of celebration. Father, I just pray that you would be with each aspect of the service, God, from the worship to the kids to the preaching to just everything, God, that you would just be with it. And God, help us to open our hearts to worship you today. And God, be with us offering, taking and using ways that we couldn't even imagine, Father. Pray this all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Kids, you're dismissed to Children's Church in the back.
shepherds, you draw the hearts of kings. Even as a baby, you were changing everything. You called me to your kingdom before your lips could speak. Even as a baby, you were reaching out for me. I have traveled many moonless nights, cold and weary, with a baby inside, and I wonder what I've done.
Amen. My goodness, what a blessing. <clears throat> All right, so before we bring the message this morning, I would like to take just a moment just to say thank you for everybody that has contributed to the um, Hearts of Calvary for the uh, Christmas gifts for the families, and I want to just say thank you for so many of you participating in that. There's been a whole lot of the uh, young people. I've seen a lot of the kids, uh, the, and I mean the kids, little kids, who have been getting stuff off of the tree or getting those hearts to help get gifts for people and uh, trying to, but now I've got tickled at one or two of them. They were trying to get the hearts off of the tree so their mom and dads could pay for the gifts, but the mom and dads made them buy the gifts, which I thought was pretty good. So, and, uh, but I, I do appreciate that so much. And if you have participated in this in any way at all, we just say thank you. And I know the families that receive these gifts will certainly be thankful too. But I just want to take a moment to pray over these before we get started in our service time today. If you want to go ahead and turn your Bible to Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, and then also John chapter 1. I'll be reading my scripture in just a minute. But before we do that, let's just pray for these families, and then there's some others too. I want to take just a moment too. I don't have a report this morning from Miss Raina uh, about her mom. Has anybody gotten a report this morning on Raina and how she's doing or, and how her mom is doing? Do we have any news from that this morning so far guys yesterday it was really dire uh, the circumstance had turned really really quickly with her mother and her mother is uh, it was frail to start with but with the COVID and she's in Kenstone Hospital and they can't get in to see her so it's just that dear lady is there and they're trying to figure out what to do next so pray for them and uh, pray for Raina I think Raina and her family all actually do have COVID as well several of them do so pray for them and uh, I know that they'll appreciate that too. Um, does anybody else have a prayer request right quick? I mean, you'd just say, preacher, I've got one, or, uh, it, or, or, or a quick praise. Anybody want to just give that testimony right quick? Uh, anybody? Don't let me miss your prayer request or a praise if somebody would like to share. Don't everybody go at one time, right? I know. Well, you act, you act like I'm about to call on you to pray. It's been the funniest thing in the world since I've been in the ministry. Anytime you get ready to call on somebody to pray or testify, nobody makes eye contact. They all start, you know, it's like, don't look at him and he won't call on you, okay? And I get that, I do. All right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. Good to see you guys here today, buddy. We'll be praying for your hand, too. Amen. 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 Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. We will. There's a, a lot of that going around right now, Brother Bernie. Amen. Kevin? She did pass away. Okay. I didn't hear that report. I'm, we'll be praying and looking for a way to serve in that too. So, guys, help us keep our ears open for that. We'll be praying. Thank you for sharing that. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Amen. Safety for journey for him. Amen. I wondered where he was. I didn't think he was out of the country, though. Amen. Well, well I'm, glad, I'm glad he's coming back home safe. Amen. We'll be praying. Who else? Anybody else? 
All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll just take a moment and have a quick prayer this morning. Our Father, we, Lord, we thank you for this day. Um, Lord, I pray today for Raina and her family. Lord, there, I know the, the heartache, I know the firsthand, I know the struggle that they go through today, and I pray that, Lord, you'd be with them as only you can. Lord, I know that we don't have words to speak that'll bring comfort, only you can do that, and I pray that you would. I pray today, Father, for the other requests that have been made here today. And Lord, I know that you are able to meet every one of those needs according to your riches and glory. And I pray that you would. Lord, I pray that you get glory out of every circumstance, every situation that we find ourselves in. And that, Father, you would help us that our lives reflect your glory as we live through this world. Have your way. And Lord, for the sweet families that will receive these gifts this year, I pray that, Father, you'd be with each and every one. And Lord, I pray that the gift of love might not be missed. And Lord, for those who have been generous to help with this, I'm thankful. And Lord, thank you so much that we pastor such a generous people. Have your way. and We'll be careful to thank you and praise you for all you do. We ask these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 3, I wrestled on this message, and I, I say that to you guys a lot. I want to tell you why I wrestle sometimes with, I don't really wrestle with what to preach, I wrestle with how much to preach, if that makes sense. And I, I really need to preach like the first three or four chapters of the book of Luke so you can get all of this message, but I'm going to get it down to Luke chapter 3 verses 1 through 6, and then I will explain where we're going with this in just a minute. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, the Bible says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, uh, tetrarch of Aturia, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now, I want to stop here for a minute because this is an important part of what we're going to be preaching on today, and it's what, it's really what Christmas is about. It's really what Christmas is about. Some years before this happens, before the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, the angel of the Lord went down and met Zacharias in the temple as he went into the temple to do what he did. And the Bible said he was the one who burned the daily incense. And so there was a special time of every service for them in the temple practice and how they practiced their, their worship services at that time. And as Zacharias was standing there, all of a sudden, the Bible says the angel Gabriel came and stood by him and saluted him. Okay. Now, guys, this is remarkable because for 400 years, the nation of Israel hadn't heard anything from God. There had been no prophet, there had been no leader, there had been no word from God. It's the intertestamental period. Now you can see, if you go back, and I'm not going to preach, this is why I want to give you some background on this before I preach this message today. The intertestamental period was a time without prophets, but it was not a time without the activity of God present. I mean, God delivered Israel in some astounding ways, even during that time. And there were some times in there they would not have survived as a nation had it not been for the mercy and grace of God. <clears throat> but they'd not had a direct message. And so <clears throat> Zacharias is in there, and the Bible says that Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were just people, and they were faithful people. They were people who loved the Lord. They were people who had not lost sight of what they should be doing. And so God chose him to come and speak to. And he comes and tells Zacharias that John is going to be born to him and Elizabeth. And the Bible says they were also well stricken in years. Okay, so this is one of those things when you read it, it's just more and more improbable. Now, I don't know how old they were, but I, I think they were past childbearing. I mean, so, and they were also, they didn't have any other children. Okay, so this was a really, really special event. And, and for them and for the Jewish people in that time, for somebody to not have children or somebody to not be able to have children was something that was sort of looked down on. I mean, it was not something that 
was celebrated. It was something that was not, it was looked on like there's barrenness or there's something wrong or who sinned. I mean, it was one of those things. And I, I want to say, <clears throat> God intervened on the behalf of Zacharias and Elizabeth and gave them John. I mean, and he tells him what manner of child he's going to be. And he also tells him who's coming next. All right. And so it's this John, John the Baptist, that goes and is getting ready to start preaching. Now, who look at all of this, and I want to preach on this a minute too. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, we know, according to the archaeologists and according to the Roman records, we know this is roughly, and I want to make sure I get this right, is either A.D. 28 or A.D. 29. Okay? So, the Word of God didn't go to Tiberius Caesar. Okay? And then you've got the word of God also passing by Pontius Pilate. Now, we know who Pontius Pilate is. He's the one who turned Jesus over to be crucified, knowing full well that he was innocent, that he was a condemning an innocent man to death. He also passed by uh, uh, Herod the Great. Now, Herod is the one who built a lot of the things that were built in that part of the country. If you studied this, and, I, and I'm going somewhere with all this, so stay with me here. But Herod was the great builder. He, he's the one who expanded Temple Mount into the, a lot of, the, uh, of the, what it is now. He's also the one who built the port at Caesarea, which was his most important, probably, uh, building that he had built at that time because it was the, the key. It was the way all of the wealth flowed in and out of that region. Now, if and you look this up on the map, you'll see this, all right? But the roadways in and out of Israel... Okay, and the port that Israel had right there on the Mediterranean Sea, and then also the, the way they're situated right there, they were the main thoroughfare for all of the trade and all of the, uh, the wealth that flowed through that part of the country. And, and to be honest with you, it's still a crossroads to this day. Okay, so really sought out, really, really important, was something that they desired to have. Why did the Romans go to such lengths? to keep Israel, okay, and I want to tell you something, the Israelis or the Jewish people at that time were not a pleasant people to try to uh, rule over, oh gosh, they were rebellious, they were a hard bunch, they would not, I mean, they would burn stuff, they would, they would assassinate, they would do, they, and the Lord of mercy, they meant not to be ruled, okay, they just absolutely did, and yet God, for 400 years, had let them go through exactly this. It was a time of serious chaos. It was a time of serious oppression. It was a time of serious darkness. It was a time that looked like it was godless. And into this time, God, in His perfect timing, spoke. Into this time, a perfect oppression. Into this time when Israel, the Bible says, they were actually the tail of the nations at this time. They were, they were a small people in a small place. I mean, with not, not much prospect, not much hope. And yet the Word of God passed over Tiberius. The Word of God passed over Pontius Pilate. The Word of God passed over even Herod and settled on John the Baptist in the wilderness. The Word of God came to somebody who was out in the middle of nowhere. He was in the wilderness. And that's where John did the majority of his preaching. We see, and I don't have time to develop all of this. I hope you'll take time and read Luke, Luke chapter 1, 2, and 3 when you get time. And I do know it's a lot of verses. I think Luke chapter 1 or 2 is like 80 verses. I think it's one of the longest chapters in the, in the New Testament, I think, is Luke chapter 1. So you've got this, this grand thing that transpires. You've got the testimony. You've got the word that's going to come. And then here's what the Bible said John would do. The Bible said that John would be the voice of one crying in the wilderness who would go saying, prepare the way, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He would go and say, and he would announce the king. He would announce that the, the Redeemer was here. He would announce the Messiah. He would go, and in the, the spirit and the power of Elijah, the Bible said that John, uh, that his clothes were uh, made out of a, a camel's hair, and he had a, a leather belt that he wore around the middle, and then he had his food was locust and wild honey. I mean, he was a rough man. And he would preach, and when he would get done preaching, nobody had to wonder if, what he meant by what he said. He was really plain spoken. And as a matter of fact, him being really plain spoken is finally what cost him his head. Now, there are people who believe John the Baptist wrote 
the Gospel of John, the fourth book in the New Testament, but John got his head cut off a little bit early in the Gospel of John, so I don't think he actually wrote the Gospel of or first, second, and third John. I don't think he wrote those either. Those are John the Beloved. But John shows up, the Word of God came to him, and so look at what happens down in verse number two. I want to give you this too. Ananias and Caiaphas being the high priest. Now, and this is an important indicator of where Israel is, okay? According to Jewish custom and Jewish law, there could only be one high priest at a time. There couldn't be two, just one. This was something that was not sanctioned by the Jewish people for anything in the world. This was done by the Roman government at that time. And the reason there were two at this time is because they each bid the same for the office. They bought the office of the high priest, in other words. It's whoever could have the most money or whoever could get the most influential friends to wind up in this role. Now, I want to say something to you today. Um, don't play games with God's temple. Would somebody say amen right there? Lord, have mercy. And sure as the world, don't just go and outbid the next fellow for that type of a role. These guys were both snakes. One of them was a Pharisee and the other one was a Sadducee. Now, we read the Sadducees wrong. We tend to read them as a lesser caste or a lesser class of people. But the Sadducees were actually people that were wealthy people. They were the merchant class. They were the people who had the funding to, to go into and to get to these offices. The Pharisees, of course, you know, we read about them. Jesus fought with them the whole time he was here. I always get tickled at Jesus' preaching when it comes to the Pharisees and the way that he dealt with them. But it's into this moment of religious confusion, it's into this moment of religious darkness, it's into this moment of corruption that, that John the Baptist comes, all right? And he, he shows up, and he's got his clear voice, and we'll talk about it in just a second, but the, the nation had lost its way when it came to the things of God. The nation had lost its way when it came to truth. The late nation had lost its way when it came to what their identity actually was. They were a people that were in the place that God had put them, but they had lost it to Him. Okay, They had lost any kind of sign of where is God and where is God supposed to be speaking? Where is the Word of God? Where, where is the walk that we're supposed to have? And they were actually people that left Jerusalem, left it to go out into the wilderness to get away from the temple system, and they were the Essenes. And I don't have time to preach on that. That's a longer message too. There are people that believe John the Baptist came from there, the Essenes. I wouldn't argue that. I would just say there are some of the teachings of the Essenes. They're in the Dead Sea Scrolls an awful lot, okay? If you study them, there are some of their teachings that are a little bit out there, okay? I, they're not exactly what we would call New Testament doctrine, so don't, don't go join the Essenes. Would somebody say amen? You're all going, preacher, we don't even know who that is, right? But look what happens. So in verse number 3, and he came unto the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So here comes John the Baptist preaching repentance. Here comes John the Baptist preaching baptism. Here comes John the Baptist saying, hey, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And all of the Jews are going, well, wait a minute. I mean, we haven't heard this message in 400 years. I mean, here's John the Baptist showing up with this message and preaching and saying, listen, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he said, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And, and this was the work of a herald. This was the work of a herald. And what they would do is a king, when he got ready, to, and th these times a king would go through, or an important person would go through a region, and before the king would go through a region, the herald would come through and say, listen, the king is coming by here, and he will bless you, but you need to straighten these roads. Hey, he wants to work for you, and he will, he will do things for you that will improve your life, but he needs to see your place as a place of beauty. So they would literally go along the roads and fill up every pothole. They would go along the roads and get rid of all of the roads rough spots they would get rid of the, the places that were uh, they had gotten used to traveling every day they traveled them so much they didn't even know what kind of bad shape it was even in but when they started thinking about the king coming through there they said we've got to straighten this out so John is the herald okay and he is saying to Israel hey it's time to straighten up the king is here 
Hey, it's time to straighten up. The kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. Hey, it's time to raise up the low places. It's time to, to lower the high places. Hey, it's time to get ready. The king is here, and he wants to leave a blessing. Now, I've got to preach on this in just a minute, all right? Guys, I want to say this to you today. I think sometimes for us in our society, we expect God to bless us without us doing anything about our low places. I think we at times expect God to answer the promises of His Word without us ever one time saying, wait a minute, I need to make the crooked straight. Okay, I think sometimes we think that God owes us something, and I think that sometimes we need a very clear voice and a very clear message that says, hey, if you want a blessing from God, when the king comes by, if you want God to do something for you, maybe you need to raise up your standard a little bit. Maybe you need to get a little bit off your high horse a little bit. Maybe we need to straighten out the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Would somebody say amen right there? Now, we can pretend we don't need this preaching in our day. Who was John preaching to? All right, and this is where the controversy starts, okay? The Jewish people didn't believe they needed the message of John because they thought because they were born Jewish people, they didn't need that because they were the seed of Abraham, so they didn't need repentance. They were the seed of Abraham. They didn't need baptism. They were the natural seed of Abraham, so they didn't need anybody telling them what they should or shouldn't do or what they should or shouldn't look like. And they were, they were really proud of being the seed of Abraham. And a matter of fact, some of them argued with John about that and said, we are Abraham's seed. And I think Jesus even argued with them and said, hold on a second. God is able of these trees to raise up, raise up seed to Abraham. So it's not about physical birth, guys. It's not about high born or low born or any other kind of born. It's about being born again. Would somebody say amen? They didn't need baptism. And they went out there and they were immediately offended because John was saying, I know whose seed you are and I know where you come from, but I'm telling you the kingdom is coming and you need to get right. I'm telling you the king is here and you need to get prepared for him. Right? I mean, so John goes preaching. Now the Jews practiced baptism but it was when they baptized the gentiles into becoming a jewish person and they called that proselytizing and jesus got on to them pretty hard about that he got on to them pretty hard about that they were listening to the message of john and saying i don't need that they were listening to the preaching of john and saying i don't appreciate him coming and preaching that we need to get right i don't appreciate him coming and saying we need to repent that's not all he preached. There's another thing that he preached. There's three groups of people that came out to hear the uh, message of John the Baptist. And here it is. Uh, it was the common people. And this is down in verse 10. I'm not going to turn you over for the sake of time. But they came to him and the people said, what shall we do then? And he said unto them, he that has two coats, let him impart to one that has none. And he that has meat, let him do likewise. Don't be self-centered. Quit being selfish. Quit letting everything be all about you. And I want to tell you something. That message, won't that message preach right now? Everything's not about us. Everything doesn't revolve around us. Everything doesn't revolve around what we are or are not doing. Guys, i got to be honest with you. It's a happy day in the life of a child of God or in a person that realizes that we are here for His glory first. Okay? And John is saying, listen, be generous. Give to somebody in need. If you have two coats, give one away. Hey, and, and also, if you have two meals, give one away. He's teaching them generosity. And then there's another group. It's the publicans. The publicans came to hear him, and they said, what should we do? And he said, exact no more than that which is appointed of you. Does anybody remember what the publicans were? Not republicans. Okay, publicans. The publicans were probably the most hated people in all of Israel because they were the Roman tax collectors, okay? And here's what they did. There was a percentage and there was an amount that each tax collector had to gather. That was what the Romans told them. You have to raise X amount of money, okay? And so, and here's what they told them. Anything over that that you can get, you can just keep it. Wow, there's no way in the world for that system to get corrupt, Right? No way for that to go sideways. Does anybody remember? There's a, now, there's a publican actually on the ministry team of Jesus or the disciples. Does anybody remember that man's name? Matthew was a tax collector. 
There's also one that I like the most in the Bible, the tax collector that is named, and his name was Zacchaeus for obvious comparison reasons, right? I mean, Zacchaeus, and y'all are all singing that song now, right, Zacchaeus? (laughs) So Zacchaeus, these guys were hated, and here they come out to hear the message of John. Because they know better. They, they've got the light of conscience. They know I'm not supposed to be doing this. They know we should not be taking advantage of our people. We know, when, and, and by the way, he's not saying don't collect taxes. He said don't collect more than you're supposed to. And can I add something to this too? Don't pay more than you should either. I don't think I have to preach this. Please pay some taxes. But don't pay more than you should. I, uh, avoiding tax is a bad idea at some point in time. Because that, trust me, they will find you. I have not done that, so don't anybody, I wonder, uh, no, 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 I'm good, amen. We go the extra mile to not get crossed up with them turkeys, because, listen, the IRS was hated in Jesus' day, it's not any worse in our day, amen, it's not any less. But he said to them, listen, here's what to do. He said, now, and, and you got to hear this because this is an important part, and I think it preaches and I think it speaks to a modern day audience exactly. The next group was the soldiers, or the ones who helped maintain order in Jerusalem or there in Israel. And they were the soldiers and they came, What should we do? Now, here's what happened the soldiers worked hand in hand with the publicans, okay, to help them exact their taxes and to help them collect the fees. And they would work hand in hand. And here's what would happen. They would go, the soldiers would go and accuse somebody of a crime. And the only way they could get out of it was to pay a big fine or to give more money to one of the collectors or some other kind of something. It was a corrupt system top to bottom. It was a corrupt system top to bottom. And John shows up preaching at exactly that moment that they need to, the Bible says here that he told them, Don't do violence to any man, neither accuse any falsely. And then he gives them something else. And be content with your wages. (laughs) Right? I mean, do you see this? I mean, here's John. Now, his message is countercultural. Okay? Because Israel, they they have gotten into this spot. Now, we know the Jewish leaders... We're all in on this corruption, they, and they are named, and it's demonstrated over and over and over again through the Scriptures. We know that they were corrupt. We know that the high priests were corrupt because they tried to buy that office, okay? And the Jewish people were saying, who do we believe? And here shows up John saying, listen, if you have two goats, give one away. Hey, if you're a Republican, don't, don't take up any more than what you're supposed to take up. And oh, by the way, if you're a policeman, don't falsely accuse people and don't participate with the publicans is what they were saying. I mean, it's a countercultural message for their day. And can I tell you something today? The message of Jesus Christ is to this day countercultural. Everybody loves the picture of Jesus in a manger. Everybody loves the picture of Jesus, the sweet Jesus there, and them coming and bringing the, the, the wise men coming. Everybody falls in love with that. Where we have trouble is when we find out that the message of Jesus requires faith on our part and obedience as well. It's not just something to hear. It's something to do. It's not just something to believe But guys, it's a behavior. You know why? James said it the best. James said, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith because of my works, or by my works. I mean, and I've got it backwards here. But the one says, I believe, and the other says, I believe, but let me show you how I believe by how I behave. Can I preach to you just a second here? We live in a time of great spiritual darkness. And I don't have to point that out to you. You know it. We absolutely live in a time of great corruption. And I don't just mean American corruption. I mean global corruption. We live in a time when the elites have their way, do what they please, and it looks like nobody ever holds them to account.
We live in a time of hopelessness for common people like ourselves because where do we turn? To who do we go? And I want to preach today. The next part of this is over in John chapter 1. And I know I didn't read all that, but i got to find a way to sum this up for you. All right, so here's what happened. Here goes John out into the wilderness preaching and baptizing there at Bethabara at, at Jordan. All right, and we went to the place where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. We, uh, we went there a time or two. And it is, guys, it's not, it's not as wide as from here to here. I mean, it's, it's a small spot right there where, the, where Jesus baptized John. Okay? And it, it was, it's a beautiful spot, but it is right there right on the, the border now with Jordan. I mean, with the country of Jordan. There's literally an armed... Uh, set of Israelis on one side of the river and remember guys on the other side of the river there's the other guys just 100 yards away are armed as well now they all know each other and they wave and speak but they that that's there's a border there and wasn't that where we went to where it said you know the minefields are here danger of death you know we all took a picture of the danger of death sign, <laughs> right we did not go and see about the minefield we all stayed really way away from any of those borders but here they are. Everybody, John is out here preaching. And he's preaching something different. He's, pre he's not up there saying, go up and keep the temple service anymore. He's not going up there saying, listen, we need to go up there and fix the temple. He wasn't doing any of those things. John is preaching the baptism of repentance. John is saying, let's, let's live better. John is saying, let's treat our, our fellow people like we ought to treat them. John is saying, listen, let's, let's be a people that is prepared because the kingdom is coming. Okay, and so the Pharisees sent out messengers and said, listen, you got to go see who that is because we're trying to figure out who he is. And so here they are. The Bible says that all Jerusalem went out to hear the preaching of John. Now, and this is an important part of this. So John the Baptist has got a decision to make. John the Baptist can make his ministry about himself. John the Baptist can make his ministry about what he's doing. John the Baptist can make it be where everything revolves around him. He's the only one on the scene right now. He could absolutely, but what did he do? He, he tells them in John chapter 1, listen, they said, are you the Christ? And he said, no, no, I am not the Christ. But listen, he's close behind me. Hey, are you that prophet? He said, no. And that's the prophet that Moses promised, okay? Jesus is actually that prophet that Moses said one is going to come like unto me, remember? Hey, are you him? Are you Elijah? And he said, no. He said, I'm the voice. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I'm just here saying the kingdom is coming. I'm just saying the king is here, all right? And in John chapter 1, look at verse 29. The Bible says, the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and says... Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Man. <laughs> All of a sudden, John's got a line of people that are out there trying to get baptized. And they're waiting their turn. They're going to him. And he's baptizing them in the Jordan. And he looks up. And here comes the Lord Jesus himself walking down that riverbank to come to where John is to be baptized. Somebody said, why would Jesus need to be baptized? So he could be identified with us. Baptism is absolutely about identification. It says I am a believer. It says I belong. It says I fit here. Okay? And that's why we say once you get saved, you ought to get baptized. So there's John baptizing. He's doing ministry. He's working. He's preaching. He's doing all of these things. And he looks up. And here comes one he's been prophesying about. Guys, he gives a clear testimony of who Jesus is and exactly what Jesus has come to do without apology. His witness is as plain as he can get it. Now, I've got to say this to you today. The first thing Jesus came to do was not to fix the things that were wrong on Temple Mount. He will do that later. Okay? In a big way. He will do that, trust me, later. He didn't fix it on this trip. He did not come to throw out the high priest of that day. He didn't even deal with it. Could he have done it? Why, yes, Lord of mercy, he could have done it. He's God. Listen, uh, 
Can I tell you something today? If you are here today and you're thinking that God is against you, can I help you with something? If God was actually against you, do you really think you'd get the next breath? If God was opposed to you, do you really think you would be able to function in any way possible? Listen, not only he's not against you, the Bible says here, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Hmm. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that's our message? Now we have a choice. We have a choice. You can build your kingdom and make it all about yourself. You can, put your own, you can build your own little world and make everything revolve around you. You can absolutely be the Lord of your life. You can absolutely be the salvation of your life. You can absolutely do your best to redeem yourself. You can absolutely just have everything about yourself you want to do. Or you can say like John, wait a minute, it's not all about me. It's all about him. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I've got a question for you. Maybe you're like those people who are saying, what should we do? Learn to not be so self-centered. One. What should we do? Don't look into your current circumstances or what's going on and ever lose hope. Because the same God who brought forth his son at exactly that moment, okay, will speak into your circumstance if you'll wait for him. He'll work for you. And then I've got to say this, and I'm going to finish with this message this morning. Maybe you are looking for him to come and fix a situation in your life, but you're not looking at him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Maybe you're hoping he'll come and overthrow something. Maybe you're hoping he'll come and just fix something big. Can I tell you something? There's not a grander office that Jesus fulfills in our lives or in the lives of our loved ones than the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Would you bow your heads, please? I'm through preaching. Our Father, today, I thank you for this day and the blessings that you have given us. Lord, I pray that you would take this message and apply it to our hearts. Lord, especially in this season, help us to be mindful of others. Help us to be generous. Lord, help us to be people prepared for a king. And then, Lord, help us to not be our own king, but to recognize you for who you are. I pray today, Father, for those who have a prayer need today, that, Father, you would show them that you have come and that you will work in their circumstance, not beyond them. There's nobody looking around just for a minute or two. <clears throat> and here's our invitation. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. <laughs> Do you need a Savior today? Behold the Lamb of God that works in our situations. Do you need Him to come? Would you like to come and have just a quick prayer? We'd love for you to come if you'd like to have a prayer time this morning. While they just play a verse or two of a song. Come right now.